Welcome to Square Notes, the Sacred Music Podcast. Your chance to learn about the teachings of the Catholic Church on sacred music, both in theory and practice, through interviews, discussions, and music. Your hearts and minds will be lifted up and better understand what it means to sing the praise of His glory. And now, your host, Dr. Jennifer Donaldson Novitska. Hello, listeners, and welcome to Square Notes, the Sacred Music Podcast, the official podcast of the Catholic Institute of Sacred Music. We've got two wonderful guests joining us today to talk about bells, their sounds, their consecration, their uses, their manufacturing, and their place in Catholic life today. I'm joined by Father Christopher Gray, who is a graduate of the Madeline Choir School in Salt Lake City and is pastor of St. Mary of the Assumption in Park City, Utah. And our second guest is Carl Scott Zimmerman, a campanologist and author of the extremely helpful website, towerbells.org. Father Gray, it's great to have you on here. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. Love it. And so I am going to start off this episode by asking you, what are some of your favorite bells you've ever heard and why? There are so many important bells in my life. So I'm very fond of, from childhood, the story about the big bell in the tower in Toledo, which has been cracked for a very long time and is very, very big and has lots of stories about it. It is inserted into my mind as one of those markers from my childhood about the nature of things, that there are these things called bells, which are very powerful, that have long range effects and do interesting things. And they can break. And even when they're broken, still have certain of those powers. It's pretty neat. Now, among normal bells that one might actually hear ringing, being in Rome for many years, I grew very, very fond of the bells of St. Peter's. That may seem kind of boring to say, but the truth is the way in which they ring them and their particular sound is, again, ingrained into me. As are several other bells, the bells of the Cathedral of the Madeline, which are not particularly interesting among those many peals of bells throughout the world, but there's a sound there which will always be the sound of home. Then there's also like the Peter Bell in Cologne, which is amazing to see, especially when they ring it and suddenly it starts sloughing off tons of snow. <laughs> That's not an image that we often see. Yeah, And also... If I may, not all bells are things which are hanging in towers. I'm very fond of uh, Dorothy Sayers. Indeed, indeed. It's a great novel. <laughs> yeah. All right. Just saying. It's a great book with bells. Yes. Play, playing an act, the role of almost a character in, the, in that novel. <laughs> exactly. And rightly so. Personified mm -hmm. bells. After all, bells are named Bells are baptized, even blessed, anointed, all kinds of things traditionally happen to bells. And not just in the West, but in the East. Bells are tremendously important and valuable sacramentals. Yes, we will get into that um, in the nuts and bolts of that. Um, but I'm wondering if you could uh, tell me a little bit about the story of St. Paulinus of Nola. I have to say that I, I, I'm unaware of this um, connection, uh, his connection to the origin of, of the Christian sense of bells. So illuminate us about his hagiography. As one can find in sources like the Catholic Encyclopedia and other kind of general knowledge about Catholicism sources, St. Paulinus is credited, among other things, as being the first to introduce the use and practice of bells in Christian worship. And from his name, Paulinus of Nola, come a couple other terms. You mean so it's not Nor Nola New Orleans? Ha, not that <laughs> Nola. This is Nola in the Campania. Nola in the Campania of Italy. So Campania, that region, gives its name to bells, which in Romance languages are called campane or campanas or whatever you want. And the thing that they go into is a campanile, the thing that holds the mm -hmm. bell and the bell itself 
are named after the place where St. Paulinus is from. Also, handbells, but they get a different name. Small bells get the Nola title going on, and it's an interesting footnote in history. St. Paulinus was otherwise a neat guy, one of those ancient fellows of the church who wrote things that we then read and learn many good and useful things. He was also the center of many correspondences among others of his contemporaries, like, for example, St. Augustine. Yeah. So um, let's take this kind of bifurcation that Paulinus of Nola's um, life gives to us into small bells versus large bells. And let's start with small bells. And I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit, for example, about the history of St. Patrick's bell and this um, subsequent obsession with um, bells in Ireland following St. Patrick. In Ireland and also in England and Scotland, this is one of those, what we call today the kind of English speaking world and that which is Great Britain or the United Kingdom and all of that, have a fascination with such bells. The first time I encountered such a bell was at the Museum of Cluny in Paris, which is a really interesting collection. And they have a, a little fragment of such a bell, a little hand bell, a bell that you hold in your hand, which then famously, there's like a dozen or more, but not, not too many more than that, that are as relics that are indicative of a person who used them, a saint, that are a representation of what they were doing with their evangelization, we would say in a modern parlance, and really just their being a church person, a churchman, that they would use the bell to call or to indicate or to bless. I think that all of those things come pretty naturally to the way in which it be used, and I think are still easily understood today. To call, to bless, the sound obviously is heard by others, travels, calls, but also blesses, that the sound drives out demons, drives away storms, that it has this quality that changes reality somehow in the area in which it can be heard. And especially because of that area where the bell is heard, quality being usually large, considered, especially coming back now, not from the handbells, but especially to tower bells and things like that, there's a, a sense that it has to be, therefore, blessed by a bishop. That it has to be the kind of thing that requires that oversight. Right. Yeah. And I mean, it's if you've ever visited the National I uh, Museum of Ireland, there's a, just a giant collection of these bells, of course, um, with St. Patrick's Bell being the prized possession there, um, as you say, a relic. Um, and it, it was treated like a relic in, in, the, in the sense that it had a, a jeweled case that um, uh, was surrounded around it. Um, and, you know, the, the bell itself looks kind of like you know, a cowbell that you'd hang around the neck of an animal. Um, it's not very fancy, but the the, the bejewelment um, indicates these things, that this is not just something that is a functional tool, though it did also serve functions. Yes, and as a relic of St. Patrick, important in centering Armagh as that place of St. Patrick and that cradle of Catholicism in Ireland. So um, let's move now to the Tower Bells, and I'm wondering if you could talk about them in their use in Western monasteries. You know, what what functions do they use? How are they timed? And what does that uh, mean for the person who has to ring them? <laughs> that is a very broad question, <laughs> because the answers are about as broad as the number of monasteries there are historically, because they will all use them a little bit differently and all those also the same. So bells with their names are also usually indicative of how they're used. And there's always the bell of the Ave Maria, for example, which guess what is going to be with a Hail Mary somewhere. And the ways in which bells are used individually, also in various combinations and not just peals, but also sequences, kind of melodically, show a lot about the places 
like for example the way in which bells ring as a timing thing as a chime we would say a chime but chime sounds diminutive when we're talking about things which weigh so many tons are the, the chimes are proper to certain places so when we think of the da, 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 for example that's a westminster chime which is of westminster there are others there are lots of others and some of them are quite complicated the melodies are interesting and they're indicative now coming to the idea of monasteries there are different sounds for different times and different days and solemnity and rank and season and the people who are the caretakers of the bell ringing have a tradition that they lean on and also that they develop <laughs> and this is very appropriate i think that this kind of bell ringing of the various melodies the choice of bells among a peal is very helpful for communicating what the bell is doing because fundamentally it's usually office mass the functions the services of the church that is attached to and usually yes attached to a church is not even so much about the bells of the monastery but rather of the oratory of the monastery the chapel the basilica the whatever it is there's also usually bells of the monastery which are different that might indicate chapter that might indicate meals usually these things are connected but not necessarily so and so the different bells become different signals but also especially as they prepare the way for liturgy to take place or prayer to take place in general are doing that function of being blessing that the sound of the bell in all the things that it touches the buildings the people the living fabric of a place and the infrastructure of wherever it may be also being blessed and being prepared for the ritual to take place. It almost seems like a participation in the voice of God and the bell ringer in that way cooperating with the voice of God that you know that that bell ringer has to know what time it is and to make sure that he shows up to ring the bells on time and then really it's a, the, the call to lay aside the labora for the aura or for other things too. I would say that the analogy is even more closely made to an angel who is the messenger of that which is to come it's not yes the voice of god but also the voice of so many other of a great chorus of angels and saints who are reminding us of so many yeah, things that's a beautiful image so we've been talking about monasteries most people don't live in or near a monastery they live near a parish so i'm wondering um, if you could tell us a little bit about what you do at your parish with a bell my church is blessed to have six bells in the tower. They are arranged do, re, mi, fa, sol. Ah, la. a hexachord. <laughs> it's delightful. <laughs> and so for differing seasons, the peel is different. Right now we're in the time of Lent. And so the peel that one would hear, for example, on Sunday before mass is re, fa, sol. But on other parts of the year, for example, after Lent is done, it will be an Easter, that will be do, re, mi, fa, sol, la. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. <laughs> Use all the bells. Use fewer of the bells. Perhaps not the mi and the fa, so you don't have to have that half step clashing. But the way in which the peel is arranged, even, is certainly very much within the realm of someone who perhaps might care about bells to want to tailor to certain things. In my church, on the normal days, the bell that is me rings for a couple minutes, a few minutes before Mass. So the morning Mass is at 8 o'clock in the morning. At 7.55, the me rings. Strike, strike 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 kind of a 
faster andante of a, of a mm-hmm. ring. And then when it comes time for eight for the mass, that's when I have placed the Angelus. In most places, six o'clock in the morning would perhaps be a little bit too early <laughs> for the Angelus. Make neighbors upset for it, maybe. Perhaps might be a little bit mean to the neighbors. Here in my place, I have no neighbors. We are in the midst of fields, and I look outside the window and I see lots of snow and mountain. It's lovely. But still, reasonable. Let us actually encourage people to pray legitimately. And so with a church with people in it, let us silently pray the Angelus as the bells are ringing it, which have the usual Angelus pattern, like in certain parts of the world that's different. But in America, pretty standard to have a set of three, another three, another three, and then some other bell that strikes. And that's how our Angelus is as well, which then rings also at noon and also at six in the evening. On any particular day at three o'clock, the highest bell, the La, will ring for a few seconds, about 10 seconds, just for the sake of remembering that hour in which our Lord suffered and gained us our salvation. And then at the end of the day, the lowest bell at eight o'clock in the evening will ring slowly. Rather, it will be struck once every 10 seconds or a minute or so to bring the day to its conclusion. Can I ask you, what are the names of your bells? I don't know. Oh, you don't? How do you not know? My, my bells aren't named. You see, my bells are in a new church that were never particularly consecrated. Ah. And so none of them were ever given a name. Right. Now, it's also interesting in the consecratory ritual of bells, looking at the Roman pontifical of old, you'd expect that perhaps there'd be like, and I name you this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And amazingly, that line is not in there. The ritual is kind of interesting for what is part of it and what is not part of it. So it has similarities to a baptism, but it's clear that this is for something that is not human, right? Can, can you get into a little bit of the ritual, um, the pontifical ritual? Yes. So we would say, and it has been said, that bells are baptized. Not entirely supportable from the ritual perspective. There is certainly water that is blessed, and it is kind of specifically for the bell, though. And so that's where it kind of becomes a little bit different from the other things that one might bless with water or otherwise baptize, but yet also similar. So the water is set aside, and with many psalms of preparation, the ritual is begun. Then the water is blessed in a similar way to the way that holy water is blessed, so not quite baptismal water, and then used to bless. But the way in which the bell is treated, especially after that, becomes really interesting. So in the pontifical, the old pontifical, there's this indication that of the substances and things that you should have around, you have to both have timiyama and tus, that is to say, incense and frankincense. And I have to admit, I haven't been able to figure out what that means. (laughs) So a timiyama could also be a brazier upon which incense can be burnt. But it is very clear that you're supposed to put the timiyama into the censer along with the tus and the mirror. So you have this interesting concoction, which is not just normal incense. It's like incense and the gifts of the Magi or something. And you put this all into the censer, and the censer comes at a very important moment into the ritual at the end, and is meant to fill the bell from underneath, such that the smoke goes only into the bell and fills it. Fascinating. At other points in the ritual, the bell is blessed with the oil of the infirm on the outside, seven times, and the oil of chrism, four times, on the inside. Interesting little details. What do you think that means? I mean, just the, the symbolism of it in the, in the ritual. There is a 
preference given to the inside of the bell. I think that if we consider the way the bell works, and we are talking about tower bells here, specifically bells that ring, that is to say that they move back and forth and are not simply clocked or struck with a hammer, fixed, that the inside of the bell, where the apparatus will be that will actually do the striking, the striker, the hammer, call it what you will, is going to there make the sound. And there comes the blessing, which is why the inside with chrism and the outside with the oil of the infirm. The outside with its many crosses, seven, kind of for the sake of making whole again, what in the course of the world and the passage of time makes old. Of course, the outside of the bell is also where the weather is. So perhaps there's a connection there. But definitely the inside of the bell is where the holy happens. Yeah. That the inside of the bell, with its chrism and incense blessing in its consecration, is from its origin, has to be the place where the holy happens. You know, so... um one of the things I learned from studying uh, the work of Olivier Messiaen was his fascination with large metallic objects ringing. And I mean, that could be a gong, it could be any number of things, but he also did love bells. And um, in in a sense, they have a sort of effect on the ear that the halo has on the eye in an image, right? There's a, so, a sort of aura surrounding um, or a, not not in the the you know eastern sense of it, but like a, a sort of emanation of the reality of the person outside the the physical body of the of the person, showing who that person really is and and the presence of God in them. And and to me, there seems to be a corollary with bells here that that you know the big overtones and the kind of mess of sound that happens surrounding this, the sounding of a bell surrounds the, this um, just instrument playing. Yes. One fundamental, but all the other overtones as well. But to me, the idea goes deeper, this notion of sound itself. You know, when we study say, sacred music, we can talk about it as a sacramental. And I think you can make a case studying, for example, what Pope Pius X says in Charlie Celestia Tunity about calling sacred music, a sort of sacramental but there's a there's a sense here too, a shared sense in which sound itself is a sacramental. Could you speak to that a little bit? Sound is profoundly important, not just to people who are used to listening, but it does absolutely have to do with that which is the sense of holiness. One of the most easily identifiable characteristics of a large room that might be a church, is its sound. That it has that particular resonance, that space, that volume. And bells have a similar characteristic, not just because we are formed in a Western sensibility. The idea of that which is holy, especially in that moment when the sound is ringing in the air, after the bell is struck and merely resonating, is I think sublime. And I would also say, yes, not just holy, but easily recognized as such. This is why a good acoustic is so important for sacred music, right? Because a bad acoustic cuts away that resonance and it, it makes it it, 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 makes it... it has to ring in the air. Yes. So, so much of the sound of bells, of course, is dependent on the harmonic series about them. We, we have a favorite harmonic series that we like. I am particularly fond of like what Petit and Fritzen does with their bells. They have that very, very pure fundamental and just the right harmonic series after that. It's a lot of fun. This morning, as I was finishing Benediction, I have the bells ring as soon as Benediction is finished in the peal because it's obviously the time of jubilation. It is a jubilus. It is perfectly sensible that at this time, after the benediction has been made, after Eucharistic adoration, that there should be rejoicing. And it is fun because 
as the ritual is coming to a close, then the bells ring, which is kind of the like, like so many ideas of commencement, both the beginning and the end. At the end is the beginning. And this morning in particular, as I was walking back to the sacristy, having finished the ritual of benediction, hearing the bells, having finished striking just in the sound resonating in the air, very much like the incense in the room. It is truly awesome. And not just some kind of religious theater. It is the incarnation of a prayer. It is the making tangible of the holy. It sounds, um, obviously, I'm inferring that you have an electrified um, ringing set up. Um, that while well, the bells are real, but they're electrified, yes, in the ringing? Yes, there are no ropes. So um, a question for you. If, if you um, had to give advice to a pastor who um, had a donor or something um, that wanted to you know, set up a bell tower, add a bell tower, add some bells, um, what, do you th- what do you think are some things that a priest might think about in that regard when he's getting ready to um, accept that gift and put it into practice? Like with many important things, talk to someone that you trust because not all bells are created the same and truly worthy bells are absolutely art, artwork. They are made in such a way that it really is worthwhile. That is not entirely indicated by price. Well, I have to say, you know, if I could just close with a a memory, you know, the last time uh, we chatted was almost 15 years ago and um, it was in Solem. And I have a particular affection for those um, bells at St. Peter's Abbey in Solem and that beautiful garden they have of wildflowers right out front. And it's, it's something that's so tied to place but absolutely imbued with the holy. It's kind of the best of the cruciform shape where the vertical and the the horizontal meet in that way, I think. Certainly. Also helps to be in the Loire in the summertime. (laughs) 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 But wasn't it interesting about the bells of uh, St. Pierre de Salem, how high-pitched they are? They're they're not particularly, as it were, meaty bells. There's a lightness to it which I find to be part of the charm. Like the Salem style embodied in a bell. (laughs) Mm. Thank you so much, Father. Yeah, thank you. Obviously, I love talking about this. (laughs) I'm glad to have given you an opportunity to do so. (laughs) Yeah, I really appreciate it. If I can touch on that question a second ago, especially about the the folk who sell the bells and who buy the bells and who are the things. Recently, I've been talking to one of those bell people a salesperson whose job it is to sell things because the clock of my bell will eventually break. It's, it's of everything around here is of an age and it will all, you know, break soon, I suppose. And I'd rather not be in the situation of, Oh, it's broken now and now it's not working. And then we have to go find a way to fix it. And then we fix it. And then all this time has passed without the ringing of bells, which I, I, would not enjoy at all. So I've been talking with the people about a new clock and it's on the one hand kind of sad because even though they love what they do, the bell sales people don't entirely get just how really neat of a thing it is that they work with. (laughs) But of course, doesn't that always happen for for people who, who work in things that the, the shine wears off and the polish somehow it becomes tarnished. So it goes. But it is really fun to talk about these kinds of things with people who are interested and excited. Yes. So thank yeah, you. I'm sure our listeners will enjoy it. And now I'm delighted to bring in our second guest for the show, Carl Zimmerman, a true expert in the development of manufacturing techniques of bells, and someone who has devoted much of his life to playing and researching bells. Carl, I'm really delighted to meet you and happy to have you on our podcast. Thanks for being here. Well, Jenny, it's a pleasure to be here. I don't often get to talk about bells. Well, I do, but 
I'm careful about that because, as I say to people, if you press the right button, I can talk all day. <laughs> we don't have time for that here today. <laughs> well, can you tell us a bit about your um, about your background and how you became fascinated by bells? Well, I grew up in a family where music was part of the family culture. Uh, my two grandfathers sang together in a male quartet for 40 years in the church where they were both Presbyterian elders. Uh, my father was a doctor, and his wedding present to my mother was a baby grand piano, which I have subsequently inherited. So music was part of family activities uh, all the time, although none of us ever became full-time musicians. I went to Trinity College uh, to do my undergraduate work, and there's a 30-bell carol on in the tower there. I sang wow. in the chapel choir, and I also learned to play the carillon. And at the time, the carillon was used almost exclusively uh, in the same way that an ordinary church bell would be, that is, to play some music before the chapel services. So wow. I got interested. That was my start in tower bells. But I went on from there to learn more about carillons and then about the foundries that make them. And I began compiling information about that. Uh, which led to some publications in the Guild of Caroliners in North America, people started telling me I should write a book. Well, that didn't work because a book would be obsolete before it got to press. But the web came along, and that was fortunate. Starting 25 years ago, I put information on the web for the Guild of Caroliners in North America uh, about the carillons that they played. But then... Over time, my interest broadened to include chimes and other kinds of bells and the foundries that make them. And then I researched the history of all the bell foundries that worked right here in St. Louis. So I cover practically anything in the way of tower bells. Can we talk a little bit about um, the tradition of bell ringing in, in England? Because it's been a uniquely preserved, you know, I think of modern instantiations of that in cultural memory, you know, things like Dorothy Sayers, uh, the Nine Tailors <laughs> yes. novel and these sorts of things. But can you tell us why it was particularly a, a, a rich tradition in, in England and how that's uh, carried on since? Well, this is another one of those situations where it's difficult to figure out just exactly how it started, because so much of it is in the dim, dark bits of history where no one was really recording the details. But my view of it is that as churches hung more bells, uh, partly for, for prestige and partly because they were following the monastic traditions of having different bells signaling different functions, somehow there was developed the technology for hanging and swinging the bell in such a way that you had more control over than just the random uh, noise that you get from a bell swinging back and forth. And what this evolved into was what is now called the practice of change ringing, which takes a team of people, one person per bell, uh, ringing the bells in such a way that the order in which they strike changes every time they strike. And this, because the bells were hung in churches, this had a connection with the religious life of the communities where the church was located. But because it had took a team of people to do it, you also had the concept of teamwork coming in, if not consciously, at least subconsciously. This was something that a team of people did together, and it became not only a religious thing, but also a sporting thing, in a way. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um yeah, it seems like the the uh, commitment to a change ringing sort of team <laughs> often was it was a was a kind of an escape hatch for some uh, people from their <laughs> you know uh, drudgery of family life that they would get out of the house and go change ringing. Well, this this is true, uh, yeah. and one of the things that often has happened then is that teams of change ringers, after they have practiced or performed will go off to the nearest pub for a social time Indeed. together. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, there were times in the past when the social aspects of it really um, took over more than the religious aspects did. And so in the 19th century, for example, there was a Belfry reform movement from the churchmen wanting to 
uh, adapt this practice or bring this practice back more in the service of the church than in the service of sport. <laughs> That seems a, a, a logical reaction to the the whole the whole, the whole phenomenon. Yes. Um, so I'm really interested in asking you to describe the process by which um, really large bells are cast. You know what what sorts of materials go into it? How are the molds made? That sort of thing. Well, this took a lot of experimenting over a period of centuries to find out. First of all, what material makes good bells? And second of all, what shape it should be used to make bells that sound good? And what these centuries of experimentation came up with is a form of bronze that is called bell metal. It's approximately 80% copper and 20% tin, although the percentages can vary a few points one way or the other, depending upon what a particular bell founder likes uh, or what the particular needs are. In modern times, there have even been a few cases where a tiny bit of lead is put in to, to keep the bell from resonating too long. That's more for concert instruments than, than tower bells, than church bells. Anyway, uh, the shape of it uh, is important because a bell making its sound is not a simple item like a violin or piano string or the column of air in an organ pipe uh, or a trumpet or wind, any kind of wind instrument. In all of those things, the, the, the shape and size of the instrument itself determines the fundamental pitch that it or frequency of sound that it can produce. And then all of the harmonics of that fundamental pitch fall into place automatically as a function of the way God made physics to work in this world of ours. Uh, so you tune uh, a piano tuner, for example, tunes according to the fundamental of a particular note, and all the harmonics fall into place automatically. A tower bell is not a simple shape like that. Uh, it's the shape of it is kind of like a teacup. If you think of a teacup as having a flared lip, nowadays they'll, you can drink tea out of all kinds of things. But if you think of uh, fancy dinnerware, the teacups have a flared shape to them. Well, turn one of those upside down and magnify it by a great deal and make it out of brass or bronze. Uh, and it will, when you strike it, it will resonate. Sometimes you can even do this with the lids of, of pots. I, I have a couple of alu cast aluminum pot lids that ring like bells if I tap them. Yeah. So, I mean, fundamentally, oh, the, the, the fundamental engineering problem seems to be the fact that the overtones are so prominent. And it's not just, um, you know, a matter of, of trying to get the sound right, but making sure that the... Um, the vibrations caused by both the fundamental and the sympathetic vibrations of the overtones don't clash in such a way that they make the material split. Well, this is true. Uh, if you think about uh, going back again to organ pipes and piano strings and so forth, the difference between, say, an oboe and a flute is not what the harmonics are, but in their relative strengths. Mm -hmm. In a tower bell, the question is not, that so much as it is what is the what are the partial tones we call them partial tones because they're not automatically multiples of the fundamental frequency well the thing that makes what was eventually discovered over a long period of time was that if you shape the bell in such a way that the strongest partial tone that's not a harmonic is a minor third then that will sound really nice to the human ear. And discovering how to do that and then how to tune a bell precisely was a, a great step forward in the 16th and 17th century in the Low Countries. Hmm. You know, I think that for a lot of people, when they, when they think about 
um, countries that have particularly excellent bells, um, they might not think of the low countries. They might think of, of course, England, which we already discussed, or especially France. So um, did this engineering, these engineering advancements from uh, just spread from the low countries into different foundries or are the different kinds of schools even to fundamental approaches to casting? Well, the great advance uh, that I referred to in, in making a bell sound good really occurred in the low countries, in found, uh, foundries in Amsterdam uh, and elsewhere in the Dutch-speaking part of the area. And the reason for that was to so that bells could be played together and sound harmonious. And this was the origin of the modern carillon. But the secret of tuning was lost for a couple of centuries. And so different foundries made different, had different ways of trying to make their bells sound better. And none of them were really terribly successful until in the late 19th century, an English clergyman went to the continent to try to find out why it was that the old carillons in the Low Countries sounded better than any of the bells in England. Hmm. Why do our church bells sound so horrible? Why do others sound better? And it was the investigation of this that led to the rediscovery of the principles of tuning bells and casting them to the proper shape so that they could make a good sound. And then... Once that had been rediscovered uh, by the English foundry, Taylor, which is still in existence, it was taken up by the two other English foundries, uh, Whitechapel and Gillett and Johnston. And then uh, after World War II, it was finally taken up uh, by some of the modern Dutch foundries. And now most of the found bell foundries in the world that try to make anything more than just single bells use those same principles of shape and tuning. I see. Well, thank you so much, Carl, for sharing your um, experience and um, years of loving the sounds of these beautiful instruments. Well, I'm happy to do it. You can find more information about them on my website, towerbells.org. Great. Thank you so much. We hope you've enjoyed listening to Square Notes, the sacred music podcast with Dr. Jennifer donaldson Novitska. For more information about this episode, sacred music resources, or upcoming events, visit our website at sacredmusicpodcast.com. You can subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, or your favorite podcast app. If you enjoy our podcast, please write us a review on iTunes. This improves our iTunes ranking and helps others find out about the podcast. The music you heard at the beginning of this episode is Hec Dies by William Byrd, sung by the London Oratory Schola Cantorum Boys Choir, directed by Charles Cole from the CD Sacred Treasures of England. The music at the conclusion of this podcast is from the Prelude and Fugue in G Major, BWV 550 by Johann Sebastian Bach, performed by Jennifer Donaldson Novitska. We look forward to having you join us next time. And until then, may we sing the praise of his glory.